Why do we sit in the sukkah? What's the what's the meaning behind that? So here here's coming back to this point in a beautiful way. Yom Kippur, we 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 detach from the physical on Yom Kippur, right? You said you go out of the holiness and you're gonna bring it down to the mundane. So we learn in Kabbalah that the high priest in the time of the temple will go into the Holy of Holies and offer up incense. The incense was considered a very spiritual thing, even today. That's not the same thing. It's not godly, but I'm saying you have like people, you know, incense and they kind of spiritualize themselves with incense, right? But it actually goes back to the temple. In godliness, it's the same idea. Lahavdil. But so it says that the holiness of the incense comes into the sukkah. And what do you do in the sukkah? You don't fast. You eat. Mm -hmm. And you say, eat the filter fish. And you say, lahaim. And you, uh, you celebrate. You bring that holiness into the, into the holiness of the sukkah. You are listening to The JP Show, where we discuss the issues you care about from a Jewish perspective. I am Rabbi G. And I am Rabbi Levy. And we hope you enjoy this episode. Okay, welcome everyone to another JP episode. Um, it's getting uh -huh. closer to Rosh Hashanah now. And um, it's ramping up. We really need to prepare and focus, especially this year, as we've been talking about. So sooner by later, will tell us what we're discussing today. But if um, you're listening, please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're listening on YouTube and write a review. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, follow us. And if you can, leave us a review. So Rabbi Levy, how are you? Well, Rosh Hashanah is coming. It's uh, in about a little more than two weeks time. So uh, we're almost in the halfway mark of Elul. Um, it's uh, been very happening around here. People are coming to learn. People have taking on new things to do, improving themselves, getting hey, ready. You looked, you looked a bit tired this morning. We both, my Rabbi Levi and myself, went to a beautiful wedding last night. We had a wedding. It was great. I think uh, a wedding is very connected to this month. You know, this month is a mm. time of closest between us and God, which we know is like a bride and groom. So it was good, but you know, it was. Our... And, and in general, you know, being at a being at a, at a simcha uh, nowadays, and especially a wedding, is, is a is a victory. Actually, we're yeah. not going anywhere. Building another yeah, family, we're new we're generation. Gonna, we're we're going to produce the next generation. We're 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 eternal. Yeah. So, okay. so what are we the, talking about today? So yes, yeah, so Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot are coming up. The month of Tishrei, as it's known, one of the most action-packed, jam-packed months of Jewish calendar. Very interesting, actually, how it's set up. It's like we have the month, the Hebrew month of Tishrei, which is like every day is a festival, especially this year. It's like it's Thursday, Friday, then Shabbos times three. Yeah. Um, so it really feels like every day is a Yontif. And then the next month in the Jewish calendar is Cheshvan, which has no Yontif actually at all. So it's like, you know, you would have thought that whoever organized this maybe should have sort of uh, spaced it out a little bit. But Judaism doesn't have to be practical, as, as you many no. times. Uh, it's, it's God's calendar. That's right. He didn't ask our opinion. Um, so talking about the month of Tishrei, so there's a lot of, obviously, um, experiences that we go through, experiences that many people do, even people who don't necessarily engage the rest of the year, try to make it to Shul once on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. Uh, there's a lot of cultural experiences that people have. I know that South Africans, which uh, I uh, come from one, are very into breaking the fast. It's like one of the uh, most important parts. Is, is, is that correct? It's like... Uh, it is. I mean, I'm into breaking the fast because I'm just hungry, but um, <laughs> no, no, just kidding. It actually is. It's actually because when you come out of Yom Kippur, it's considered actually a festival because we're so confident right. that Hashem has right. forgiven us and going to bless us with a great year, so we celebrate. Yeah, but yeah. it's a big thing. It's like a huge thing, I guess, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of cultural things, of course, like, you know, the first night Rosh Hashanah, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit, but, but besides for that, what perhaps maybe we don't put enough emphasis on is the mitzvah, the actual commandments that we have uh, to do during these this month. So, for example, uh, blowing the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, of course, fasting on Yom Kippur, but that's not an act, that's more of like a passive thing. We don't eat. Um, on Sukkot, we, we, we sit in the sukkah and we shake what's called the four species, the lulav, the etrog, the hadassim, and the aravis, put them together, we give it a shake. So I want to maybe just discuss those a little bit. And, and uh, perhaps what do you do? You left that one. What did I forget? What did I forget? Khatra, we dance. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Simchas Torah. Uh, we, we dance with the Torah. And, you know, hopefully we'll do a podcast as we come closer to that, perhaps dedicated to 
Simchas Torah of this year, which is going to be extremely interesting. It's going to be yeah. the first dark yeah. side. Of the, it needs to be discussed. Holy... Not, not for today, but we will do yeah, it. Yeah, no, we'll definitely uh, dedicate a podcast to that. Um, yeah, you're right. So there's so many things that we need to do. So let's let's discuss more of a general concept that really is the the uh, the common denominator with all of them. And they're all a little bit strange and they're all a little bit weird. Um, you know, we blow a horn, we shake some branches, we uh, <laughs> we dance with a book. It's like very strange. Like, why are these things important? Like, I understand the cultural parts of, you know, we sit together with the family, you have Rosh Hashanah meal, celebrate the new year, you know, we come to shul and all that. But why, why are these things like blowing a horn and shaking branches? Like, what, what are we achieving exactly by doing these type of things? So I think, first of all, it's important to just make a general comment on that, right? And that is that what we find with Judaism is that it is a religion of action, which has under two things I think we need to understand. Number one is we actually don't have cultural experiences. I mean, we have a culture, of course, but the purpose of our experiences is actually not cultural. The purpose of our experiences, whether it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, whatever it is, is that we experience something internally. We experience Pesach, we experience freedom, not just remember. So really, it's not historic, nor is it cultural. But there's an energy with every festival, particularly. I mean, this is true with all of the mitzvot, but there's a there's an energy that happens at that time of the year. And we connect that energy, and we reveal that spiritual energy in the world. Right? Or or even, even every day, when we do a mitzvah, we're not just, like we put a mezuzah on a door, for example. Again, it's not a cultural symbol. It's tapping into a particular energy, which is why it's governed by all sorts of laws. For example, that a mezuzah, right? A mezuzah has to be written in a certain way, and if it's not written in a certain way, it just doesn't work. It, it's culturally beautiful. You can have a beautiful mezuzah up there, and maybe you're still tapping into the culture, but it's not about culture. It's about something, tapping into something transcendent, something something high, right? But here's the... Here's the point, and this is what makes Judaism unique. When we say tapping into something very spiritual or very high or very transcendent, it's not about going to another world of spirituality. It's about bringing that spirituality into our physical and mundane life. It's becoming a different person. It's becoming a, a person that is refined, a person that is connecting to God, but in this world. We, we understand Kabbalistically and, and from Hasidic philosophy that the whole purpose of creation is to lift up and elevate this world. This world means with all of its coarseness and all its mundaneness and, and bring make make a home, make a home for God, make a home for for something great in this in this world. Right? Um, make it tangible, make it really part of the real life, which is why. In Judaism, most of the mitzvot are all about physicality. We have a physical candle for Shabbat. We drink physical wine. We eat physical matzah. We, we don't just contemplate on freedom. We actually eat the matzah because we want that energy of freedom to, to actually become part of us. And the same thing with the, the journey of the month of the high holidays, right? It's a whole month. And each part of this month is so amazingly deep and so amazingly uh, sort of holy and spiritual in its own way. And we want to connect we want to connect. We want to connect all of us, the whole part of us, every part of us, not just our brain, not just our heart, not just our soul. We want our body, everything about us to connect to what's going on and to make the world, the physical world and all of us part of that experience. So why is it not just... An, so let's flip, let, let's flip the question the other way around. Why can't we just do them and not think about it. Do we have to actually learn about it? Do we have to actually prepare for it? Let's just take a horn and blow it, and then we're achieving the purpose. Because we're okay, now, to... you, now, you've, now you've flipped the whole question. Come back <laughs> on say it. That's good. The real That's Jewish good. thing to do, right? That's great. That's great. That's a good question. It's a good question, right? So I think it's about, maybe let's put it simply. It's about bringing heaven into earth, right? Mm. You first have to understand what the heaven is. Right. You have to experience that. Right? And then bring it into the earth, meaning the earth of yourself, like your physical part, your tangibility, right? Yeah. Well, let's put it a different way. Um, we, we each have within us heaven and earth. So like, for example, so you can, so you can have two people, right? So let's, 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 let's describe it this way. You can have two people. One will, you know, contemplate, uh, let's say on the shafar, for example, right? And meditate and understand the significance of the spiritual power and, and energy and Kabbalistic stuff and, 
but he won't, won't actually blow the shofar, right? So he hasn't done the mitzvah, but he just hasn't connected with it at all. Mm-hmm. Doesn't work. Then you're the guy, I'll just pick up a shofar and just blow it. Truth is, that person's probably off better. He actually has done it. He's done the mitzvah, which is he's connected tangibly, but he's done it with his hands. He's done it with his physical part. He hasn't connected the whole of him with it. His own heaven, his own spiritual aspect, his own soul. The idea is to combine the two and connect every part of us to what's going on. Okay. So I think what we're going to do now is I'm going to do a rapid fire style question here. So really every single mitzvah of Tishrei needs like a three hour share on, 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 on each of them. At least three hours. <laughs> yeah, at least. So what we're going to do is I'm going to name a mitzvah of Tishrei of, of this next month. And I want you to give a very short insight on, on each one, but maybe an insight that not like, you know, for example, if I say dip apple in honey, which is not a mitzvah, but it's an important custom, of course. Uh, so that's, you know, even cu- the truth is the uniqueness of this month is not only the commandments, it's also the Custom. customs that we have. And I think going back to what you said, customs are also not just cultural. Customs also have holiness and energy. Mm-hmm. And, and that's for another podcast, but in a way they're even deeper and, and they're, they're very important. So, you know, if I say apple and honey, don't just say we're going to have a happy, sweet new year because everyone knows that, hopefully. Okay. Let's do something that uh, perhaps will catch people by surprise. Okay. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure if we should go in order or out of order, but, you know, Dude. we'll just throw anything. Why do we fast on Yom Kippur? What's the point of fasting? I don't know. To me, it's just you just feel hungry. By the time it comes three o'clock in the afternoon, you just have a headache. What, what exactly have we achieved? Okay. <laughs> That's, a great... <laughs> That's a great question because out of all the ones of the Tishrei, out of all the ones of the mitzvot, actually, that one is a bit more spiritual than, 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 than physical. That's true. Right, because, because this is the point, right? The, the point is, like I said before, you can't just be physical. In other words, yes, the whole point is to bring it into the mundane world, but you also have to bring, what are you bringing in? You've got to bring something transcendent, something high. So Yom Kippur is when we do that. Yom Kippur is when we just escape. And we, we actually detach from the physical with mm-hmm. the intention of bringing it back to the physical, which maybe explains the breakfast oh, there enthusiasm. You go. That's not right. just about eating her, right? Yeah. Because it says that when the high priest would, in, 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 in temple times, the high priest was like the main man on Yom Kippur, he would go into the Holy of Holies, yeah. and it says he would come out, he would make a whole Yom Tif to celebrate. Yeah. The expression is, but min, min, min Kodesh, when he came out of the Holies, which is the whole purpose of coming out and right. bringing yeah, out. Yom Kippur into the, into the rest of the world. Exactly. Okay, um, why do we shake branches on Sukkot? What, what are we doing there exactly? Okay, so the idea is there to create oneness and unity. So, again, same idea. We know that the four species actually each represents a different type of Jew. Um, because it's rapid fire, I'm not going to go into each one in detail, but but each a different different levels of observance, levels of Torah knowledge, whatever the case is, bring them all together, and we show that they're all one. But again, we're actually not just symbolically showing that one, when we bring it together, we're actually creating a sense of oneness. We're creating, creating a, an ability within ourselves, first of all, to unite different parts of ourselves. Because sometimes some people say the, the lulav is like the, the spine and the hadassim and the myrtle is like the eyes and the arvaz like the lips. There's another idea, right? The etrog is the heart. So we, we create oneness within ourselves and it gives us the power and the energy to create oneness down here with other people as well. Not just a symbol, it's generating an energy of oneness. Why don't we shake it? Why can't we just put it together if it's about happiness? Unity? So that's the ultimate happiness. Okay, great. It's, it's All right. Like really something, it's like dancing. The love is dancing. That's when right. can we really dance? When we connect it to each other. Right. Oh, that's great. Okay, very good. Why do we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah? What's the meaning behind that? The yeah, shofar is, well, it's a wake-up call, but also it's a cry from the depths of the heart. It's a cry of a child, I'm coming home. It's a, it's a simple sound, has no words, but it, it expresses the most deepest connection that we have. But here's, 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 the, here's the point, right? Shafar is the real question. Why would you just like, you want to cry? So let's meditate and cry and inspire ourselves and really cry. The answer is no, because the cry has to come from every part of us. It comes from the depth of the soul, but it's got to affect everything. It's got to affect the most mundane. In fact, what's what's a shofar? It's a horn. It's actually, by the time it's made into a horn, it's not even an animal. It's an inanimate object. It's like a silent object. It's nothing. It's just a piece of stone, almost, right? Again, same thing. We've got to bring that idea, whatever we're crying for, whatever we're connecting to, it's got to permeate every part of us and every part of the world, even a piece of stone. Right. Why do we sit in the sukkah? What's the what's the meaning behind that? So here, here's uh, coming back to this point in a beautiful way. Yom Kippur, we 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 detach from the physical on Yom Kippur, right? You said you go out of the holiness 
and you're going to bring it down to the mundane. So we learn in Kabbalah that the high priest in the town of the temple will go into the Holy of Holies and offer up incense. The incense was considered a very spiritual thing, even today. That's not the same thing. It's not godly, but I'm saying you have like people, you know, incense and they kind of spiritualize themselves with incense, right? But it actually goes back to the temple. In godliness, it's the same idea. Lahavdil. But so it says that the holiness of the incense comes into the sukkah. And what do you do in the sukkah? You don't fast. You eat. Mm -hmm. And you say, eat the filter fish. And you say, l'chaim. And you, uh, you celebrate. You bring that holiness into the, into the holiness of the sukkah. Okay, give us a reason why we did apple and honey that no one knows. I can't say no one knows, because I've given a sure in this floor. But what you meant was not that we can have a sweet year, which is also true, by the way. That's the idea that... That is the reason something. why we do it, of course. Yeah. Sorry? I mean, that is the literal reason why we do it. Right? Yeah, of course. And, and by the way, it's not just... Why, I mean, why don't we just wish for a sweet year? The idea is that what you do in the physical counts, again, same idea. Every every nuance, every custom, every mitzvah generates wholeness. So we generate... We're not just wishing a sweet year, because I could just wish you. We don't have to worry about the honey. Um, but 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 the idea is that it, that it actually generates blessing for a new year, right? But here's a nice here's a nice idea also to make it more 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 tangible. Apple is a beautiful fruit; it's delicious, but it doesn't last very long. It doesn't have a good shelf life. Um, you leave an apple on your shelf for a couple of days, it goes rotten. Correct? Mm. Honey on this opposite. Honey is a preservative. People used to preserve things, and honey honey has a shelf life forever, right? I think um, the idea is when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, we're all fresh, we're inspired, we're enthusiastic. We listen to a good podcast. We listen to a good shir. We, you know, we decide, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to change. We'll do something new this year. We're going to get less angry. We're going to have a better relationship. We're going to do another mitzvah. That's that's the deliciousness. That's the apple. But what we have to also do in Rosh Hashanah is to commit to its sustainability, to commit to, to permanence. So we take the apple, which is that fresh hope, that fresh commitment, that fresh resolution, and we dip it in the honey, generating that sort of energy that we're not just going to do it for a few days, and it's not going to have a short shelf life, but we're going to preserve it. And the honey, it's going to last us a whole year. Hmm. So that's a, a nice idea. So every family has different customs. You know, it's more true when it comes to Pesach. I think Pesach, every family has their tunes and their things. But it's true about every festival. Do you have any family things that you think maybe no one else does, but just uh, our family our, our, our family does them? Um, I actually have something in mind. I'll tell you two things. Just Okay. One is a cute thing, just from my childhood memory. Um, so this is not my family. This is like a general thing. There are many people who haven't been accustomed to eat simus on Rosh Hashanah. Mm. You know what simus is? It's yeah. like carrots that are cooked with honey. I don't know. It's very sweet. It's like a syrupy sort of thing. I don't particularly like it, actually. But yeah, I don't yeah. like it either, actually. So this is the joke. In my house, we had simus every Shabbos. But people eat simus on Rosh Hashanah because in Yiddish, it's made out of carrots. And in Yiddish, carrots means, you say the word merin, which also means to multiply, like mm. multiplicity of blessing. So when I grew up, I never ate simus on Shabbos, even though my mother was a bit upset about me, about it because she wanted she liked simus and she thought it was very important to eat simus on Shabbos. But I do it once a year till today. I eat simus once a year on 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 Rosh Hashanah just for the custom. But the other one is that my mother had a custom, and I, I haven't heard it in many families. I've heard it from a few. This is what you think of the shapes of the chalas? Yeah, yeah. So that we on, on Rosh Hashanah there was different there was different customs. Around Rosh Hashanah and Erev Yom Kippur, and at the end of Yom Kippur, there were chalas made in different shapes. So there were shapes of a hand, like, like this, like you know, like this, and uh, and the hand was to receive all God's blessings. There were shapes made in a form form of a ladder, because the ladder was our prayers got up to heaven. Hmm. Um, and then there was the traditional sort of round chalas, which is the infinity and infinite blessings and so on. Amazing. So I'm going to leave. I do want to talk about Simchas Torah. I think we're going to dedicate a podcast just to Simchas yeah. Torah a little bit later. That Including means, of how we celebrate. like now. Yeah, yeah, that needs special attention this year. Uh, but let's just end off with something that I don't know if everyone even knows about it, but let's just uh, put it out there. I think probably one of the most weirdest moments of, of the month. I mean, it's, like I said, if someone has never been exposed to Judaism and would follow a Jew around uh, in the month of Tishrei, they would, they would think we're a little odd. Um, but... Probably one of the most oddest moments is on the last day of Sukkot, known as Hoshana Rabbah. Uh, there's an ancient custom that we take willow branches and we bang them on the floor five times. If you walk into shul at that moment, it's like everyone's taking branches. You have adults, right? Not little kids, adults holding branches, banging them on the floor five times. What's going on there? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> 
So first of all, it's about, we, I'll tell you a Kabbalistic thing, we know that there's one of the themes of Tishrei, one of the themes of this whole month, that has got to do with Shofar as well, and the honey, we won't go into that now, but one of the themes is transformation of anything that's potentially negative into, into, into sweetness. Mm. So we know that the, um, in, in we have chesed and gvura. we have kindness, and we have like severity or firmness. Firmness can be a good thing, but sometimes it's a negative thing, like it's justice, it's, it's judgment. So part of the whole high holder process is channeling the judgment into strength rather than judge, judgment. And God is merciful. And on the contrary, the strength turns to strong blessing. And we do it, there's many places in the month where that comes up. So one of the ideas of these five willows is willows, on the lulav, there's two um, species, the myrtle and the, the willow. Myrtle is chesed, that's kindness, blessing. The arava actually is, is gevurah, right? It's, it's severity. And Kabbalah teaches us that there are five components of gevurah. So you take these five willows and you bang them on the floor. That's the concept of neutralizing the, the severity, the judgment, and the firmness, and turning it into firm blessing. And we do it specifically with the arava also, because the arava is a symbol of a very simple Jew. It has no taste, has no smell. It's a very simple, bland plant. And we highlight the beauty of every simple person. It's the simple person that can change the the gvura into 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 firm blessing, into strong blessing. Okay. Is there anything else you think I should be mentioned that we haven't uh, covered here? I'm sure there's lots of other things. But can I just maybe finish off with a, a call to action? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think one of the, for you know many people have heard me say this, but. I think one of the most, you know, we live in a time now, especially, you know, around this war and everything, we really need to connect to our Jewishness in a stronger way. And I think one of the most beautiful and powerful ways, all mitzvot are important, but one of the most beautiful and powerful ways of connecting to our Jewishness is connecting to the Jewish calendar and implementing it, connecting it and engaging, experiencing the Jewish calendar. And there's nothing more powerful in the, in the Jewish calendar like this whole month beginning of Rosh Hashanah and ending in Simchat Torah. So I want to I want to encourage people to just engage in it more than they have till now. Mm. So we're doing a, for example, we're doing a, a service second day Rosh Hashanah in Vaucluse. If you're not used to going to Shul second Rosh Hashanah, come, come along. Uh, if you don't normally hear the Shofar, find out where they're blowing the Shofar and go listen to it. Contact us if you're not sure where to do it. Um, Sukkot, if you've never sat in a Sukkah, contact us. We'll, we'll arrange you to visit a Sukkah or to Make a blessing on the lulav, even if it's once during Sukkot, but engage in the in the experiences of the of the Jewish calendar. It's beautiful, and I'm sure it'll bring down tremendous blessing. Amen. Absolutely. All right, everyone. See you next, next time. time, everyone. Till next time. A shana tova, a meaningful elul, and uh, we'll see you next time.